Welcome to another episode of The Shift with Elena Agar. In this episode, I chat, chat with Brandon Bustid. He is the Chief Partnership Officer at Kaplan. And prior to that, he spent um, many years in just in, wearing different hats in organizations such as Gallup and others, and really leading in the higher education slash kind of corporate learning world. And what I love about the work that he does is he's really trying to close that gap between higher education and the corporate world. And just discussions with him are always insightful, phenomenal, and just super super, super interesting. Um, so check it out. I think you'll really enjoy this episode. Um, he's top, top person when it comes to closing that gap. So enjoy it. Brandon, welcome to the Shift Podcast. Hey, thanks for inviting me. Looking forward to the conversation. Likewise, I've been looking forward to this conversation for a few years now, and we've been connected since 2020. And I was like, why have I thought to bring him on board? I've been running this podcast for ages, and you're like the perfect person to talk to about all the different challenges that we have in higher education, the new generations coming in, and what can we actually practically do to make a change happen? So uh, just to to kick us off, start, share your, your journey and kind of what led you to your current role at Kaplan, where you're focusing on that intersection of learning and work. Yeah, so I've sort of had three jobs, I guess, since I left college. Uh, I started a, a company shortly after I graduated uh, as an undergrad uh, that, that was one of the first ed tech companies. I mean, this was the year 2000. Ed tech wasn't a term that was coined. And um, we had a very unique mission, which was uh, developing online courses to help prevent uh, alcohol abuse, uh, sexual assault. Um, and then also started to get into, you know, other kind of related topics like mental health awareness. And so, you know, that was kind of the first 11, 12 years of my career with building that company, which was called Outside the Classroom. It was acquired by EverFi. And, uh, and then, you know, when that was acquired, I went to Gallup to help build an education and workforce development practice within Gallup. And that was about a seven year run. And then I've now been at, at Kaplan for a little over five years leading all of our work with universities and with employers. And it is a broad set of uh, educational activities and support services that runs the gamut from international student recruitment to preparing workers for industry uh, certification, licensure, professional licensure, um, and working to support you know any various aspects of their education benefits, training and development programs. So it's a it's a pretty broad diverse set of activities but you know the, the the space of this intersection of learning and work is really a space i've lived in since uh since my time at gallup so for the better part of you know 11 12 years that's what i've you know spent a lot of time you know working on research writing speaking uh and then you know making things come to life uh for for universities and companies in that in that intersection uh, so you also have this um, newsletter, and I want to kind of uh, uh, talk a little bit more about that. So you have uh, Bastide Bold, and recently, uh, related to your work with these institutions and, and higher education institutions, you recently wrote, not recently, it was actually an article that you wrote about a month ago, but it was with data that aged really well for you. And you were talking about that the number one reason Americans value higher education is to get a good job. And so in your collaboration, in the work that you've been doing, whether in Gallup or Kaplan, um, what does that collaboration look like with institutions and with leaders of those institutions? Because we're saying that number one thing is to get a job, but then the um, actual results on the ground in terms of how CEOs view it. So you mentioned 11% of C-level exe level executives say, yes, graduates are ready. You have 13% of US adults overall saying, yes, education prepared, higher education prepares you for jobs. But yet the, it seems that the gap is almost growing and growing and growing. So what has in your experience been kind of the challenges that higher educations have? That was a long, long question, but yeah, look, you've hit the the salient points. There's very little confidence in the work readiness of college graduates. That's a major issue because the number one reason why Americans value higher education is to get a good or better job. It's not the only reason why they value it, right? So that's a point that I think a lot of people get tripped up on because there's there's still this, I think, silly debate within higher ed around the purpose of college, right? Is it you know, about job training, right? And thinking about that very narrowly as like a job for a for-profit company and, you know, the, the corporatization of higher ed, like that's not the point. 
you know, when, when you talk about a job, that's that's a job, any job, right? That's a job in state or federal government. That's a job working for nonprofits. That's a job, by the way, in higher education, in the academy, right? It, in addition to, you know, businesses and, uh, you know, but but there's this debate. Is it about, you know, preparing graduates for a job or is it about preparing them for life or, you know, thinking more broadly around, you know, the value proposition of the liberal arts? And, and I keep saying, everybody, it's a both and, right? We, we need to stop this silly either or discussion. Employers want graduates that are both broadly educated and specifically skilled, period, full stop, end of sentence. That's what they want. And so why aren't we trying to do both? So, you know, the, the work that I've been trying to drive into the field is really about, okay, we know actually how to do this. We just haven't scaled it. I think this is the fundamental problem that higher education is dealing with. And to some some degree, you know, high schools um, and, and middle schools, which is that there's always examples. Every college I go to will say, oh, yeah, we have an internship program. And, and then they talk about usually a hyper specific program that like 30 students are part of. And, and there are very few institutions that have scaled this kind of work integrated learning experience for every student. The great co-op schools like Northeastern and Drexel and Cincinnati, or if you go to Canada, University of Waterloo, these are large institutions, thousands of students enrolled there, and they have found a way to scale co-op or internships or whatever it is to all the students at their school. So, so it's not that we can't do this, and it's not that it's rocket science, it's that we haven't been intentional and most institutions of higher education haven't made it a priority focus, right? Where it has happened, we have been able to scale it. But if you just say, what are we really falling down on? Less than a third of college graduates in the United States had some kind of job or internship during college where they were able to apply what they were learning in the classroom. That's our big failure. Great that it's happening for a third of graduates, but two thirds are missing the mark. Um, and then, you know, you have this uh, this both perception and reality of people saying, you know, I don't think graduates are very well prepared for work. Why? Fundamentally, they've just had less work experience than any previous generation that's come before them. That's the thing that we need to change. And it's something that requires both partnership from higher ed and employers. Right. This is about employers stepping up just as much as it is higher education, reframing what they value what they're going to be intentional with about the student experience. Mm. I mean, yeah, on the on the corporate side, I've kind of worn both hats. I've been on the higher education side now on the corporate side. There's definitely a big gap in terms of just how do we bring on young talent, the, the relationship uh, between the two. And for me, like uh, for the university side, I, 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 I tend to agree it's both, right? I have my, you know, I, I did my bachelor's, I have my master's. So like it gave me a lot of value. Did it give me that career? Necessar not necessarily, but it gave me a lot of other value for sure. But I've also worked since I was 15 years old. So the, the, this, this notion of just like learn, learning how to make a dollar, we're not, you know, just any experience, I always say, whether it's waitressing, cleaning houses, whatever it is, any experience drives that. And so my, my kind of, you know, where I struggle with, with universities is then, then let's not market it as it's going to get your job. But I used to be do a recruitment for a university, a large university in the States. And that was the thing. That was what we were selling when we'd go on the road, like where it's going to get you, but it's not. So then I start having this like values issue. And so I don't mind if universities are just honest and say it may or may not, but you see a lot of messaging, a lot of marketing, a lot of money is being put into that versus career services, making all those right. things that you're talking about. And I'm like, this is like, I'm just curious your, your opinion, because it's like, there's plenty of funds to go around realistically. If you take a little bit from marketing, put it towards career services, these people are going to market you better than any any marketing material you can do right. so yeah. do you know what i'm saying like look, look i totally agree with you you know i one of the articles i wrote in forbes now probably a few years ago was titled you know career services will drive the next big enrollment boom in higher ed and mm -hmm. it was this exact point that you're making which is that if you deliver great results on those career outcomes and you've delivered those in the form of valuable services and support for students in their college journey, um, it's one of the most important things that you can deliver on in terms of the overall value proposition. Let's put a fine point on it. There's, there was Gallup research that came out in 2016 that said this. And just last week, this was one of the things I commented on last week on LinkedIn, um, there was a Lightcast survey that came out, both of graduates, college graduates, right? 
And those who, so very few visit career services, take advantage of career services, right? Career services offices are, you know, overwhelmed, understaffed, right? And and usually they're in the, the corner basement office of, a, you know, the edge of campus, you know, they're not kind of front and center to the student experience. Anyway, long story short, um, not many students uh, experienced career services support. Those who did, if they found that it was valuable, it triples the odds that they believe their education was worth the cost. Okay, so just think about it. You're a president, you're on the board of trustees of a university. You know that there's a magic formula for tripling the percentage of your graduates who go, yep, definitely, that was worth the cost, that was worth every penny. Wouldn't you wave your magic wand and make it happen for every student? I mean, that was my provocation last week. So, so there's the data, right? A graduate who had a valuable experience with career services triples their odds that they say, my education was worth the cost. And I think that stat alone kind of tells the whole story. Mm. I, I couldn't agree more. You know, and as I, as, I, as I listen to these conversations and I have those conversations with colleagues and I'm like, why don't they just do it? It's mind blowing because they're, it's, it's not necessarily, you just, it's not necessarily going to cost you more. Like that's the big thing. I remember when I was in higher education, I was doing career services stuff as well. And it was like, well, you know, it's not a priority. What do you mean it's not a priority? That should be the priority. So, so, you know, or even just tying in like internship, like you said, like some universities do it well, but most universities will require one internship. So you have a student graduating, um, you know, 21, 22 years old, one internship, and then they're asking for salaries because I'm on the other end of this. I do recruitment and it is I, I'm not, I mean, I, I can spend a whole hour just talking about the discrepancies between what they what they actually know and bring to the table to the salaries that they're expecting. If there's a huge, somebody did not tell them how world the world works. I mean, few, I'm not talking 10,000, I'm talking 50, $60,000 a year off, like on top of their, ex, what, what it should be for that level. So so it's it's any any thoughts of like what is it? Sometimes I feel like I'm like is it like I go into conspiracy? I was like is it just meant to keep us down? Like I'm like why? Because it's so easy. It's so easy to implement. It really is not that complicated. Yet so many don't do it. Why? What's your well, gut look, feeling? I, I'm gonna uh, there, there's there's a number of reasons behind that, but I want to focus on kind of one point that you know I've been spending more time talking about, um, and that is that somehow we've lost the learning value of work. Right. I think that's the fundamental issue in higher ed, right? I can't tell you how many college faculty I've I've talked to or have come up to me after I've given a talk or have commented on something I've said on LinkedIn where where they say, you know, my job is not to get students a job. You know, my job is to, you know, and they'll, you know, they'll 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 come up with some form of an eloquent statement about preparing them for life, you know, making them a lifelong learner, preparing them for you know, uh, a career, not just a specific job, right? And, and by the way, those are all important attributes of what we're trying to do. But um, but I think in in thinking about job and work, right, we've made a couple mistakes. We, we kind of rush to assume that this is all about the corporatization of higher ed, right? This is just about getting students high paying jobs in corporate America. That's not the story. This is about all jobs. This is about all type of work humans find great purpose in work, right? So put salary aside for a second. You have a great job, a job where you're able to use your strengths at some point every day. That's a person with great purpose. That's a person that has high well-being, right? These are all statistical mm -hmm. relationships that have been documented. And so I, I try to uh, change the way first, the way we think about what it means for job, right? Job is about purpose. It's not just about pay. And then, and then the related piece is there's so much learning that we can learn from any job or role, right? So you said you started working, you were 15. I did too. Actually, it was earlier than that. If you count my paper route that I ran when I started about 12 years old, um, I was a cashier at a Ponderosa Steakhouse, right? It didn't take me long to learn the cash register, a few days. But if somebody had helped me think about that job where I was a student of that job and workplace, even kind of a frontline retail job like a cashier can become an incredibly valuable learning experience, right? What if uh, somebody had given me prompts to evaluate the motivational style of the manager at that branch, right? Mm -hmm. What did he or she do that was m motivating to employees? What did they do that was demotivating to employees? Did you ever see a situation where one of the servers uh, you know, dealt with an angry customer in a really productive way? 
Where did you see it not so productive? What was the difference, right? Mm -hmm. Did you see any ethical dilemmas like the chef who would constantly drink the chocolate milk in the refrigerator and never pay for it, right? How do you address that, right? Mm -hmm. And I mean, my point is there is learning from all types of jobs and work. And I think that we've lost sight of that reality. So even students who don't have a an internship, right? Like a formal internship program where that might be curated, a faculty member can ask students, hey, do any of you work? Oh, you do. You're a, ca you're a cashier at Ponderosa, Brandon. Well, you know, let me give you some prompts to think about analyzing that workplace, right? Questions of supply chain management. You know, how did the stakes at Ponderosa get to that table, right? I mean, mm -hmm. a fascinating thing to unpack. So I say this because we need to bring back uh, an appreciation for the learning value of work. And, and, and I think it goes even to well-intentioned parents, right, who I've heard many examples of this where parents will say to a kid, if they can afford to not work, your job is to get good grades. Mm -hmm. So I don't want you to work because I want you to focus on getting good grades. That's your job. Now, I believe it's important to try to get good grades, but that is not the only equation, right? And we know that that's only a small portion of the ultimate formula of success in life. One of the big ones is having some real work experience. Even if that was a crappy job, it still is a rich learning environment if we just start to think about it that way. Hmm. Uh, it's it's a, such an excellent point. I didn't even think about it from like taking it like, you know, whether you're a teacher or a professor and saying, have you thought about that? And actually having these little cues for them to evaluate. That's brilliant. Um, and, you know, it's also it's part of it is the, the learning, but it also teaches you patience and humility and customer service and emotional intelligence. And uh, there's there's so many other soft skills that, again, so many graduates are missing that, you know, and just there's a gratitude. Like I've never been so grateful to have a corporate like I always look back to all the other jobs that weren't as 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 nice and you know I work from home and like you know and you appreciate that because you know what there's other jobs and and there's people that are you know uh, uh, that have really hard jobs you know so then you're you're like what am I even complaining about and I think there's a lot of that going on in the world and I think part of it is because we have not been exposed to not that people should be exposed to 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 bad things but people should be exposed to hard challenging atmospheres in in a, in a safe environment obviously you know we're not talking about you know uh um, you know so life-threatening circumstances but i think hard work and challenges the earlier the better um and and i wanted to kind of pivot or uh, a little bit more towards also there's this uh, i'm sure you've heard of young there's a um this this whole challenge of young men that are just simply checking out from the workforce i don't know if you've seen some of those statistics and and a lot of those are you know some of the saying well because there's a skills gap but a lot of it is actually has to do with mental health a lot of it has to do with um the online lives that they live you know i think on average they're saying a a, a male between ages of 18 to 40 spends 2000 hours a year on playing uh video games i think that number is probably much higher for for the younger generations, especially Gen Zs that I love to pick on these days. So I'm sorry if you're a Gen Z listening to this, um, but I'm trying to help you. <laughs> I hope. But so any thoughts about that? Like, have you have you had those conversations with people? Yeah, look, it's a it's a huge issue that uh, very few people are paying attention to. Um, in fact, I just finished reading about, you know, a few weeks ago, uh, a book titled Of Boys and Men by Richard Reeves. And uh, for those of you who haven't read it, uh, I, I mean, I think it's a must read for anybody uh, in the education or, or, uh, or workforce development world. And it hits on some of the points that, that you made. Um, you know, less than 25 years ago, the balance of men to women enrolled in college was 60 to 40 in favor of men. It's now 60 to 40 in favor of women. And that, first of all, that's a really important dynamic for women, right? Reeves makes this point in the book that, uh, you know, advocating to to address inequities doesn't come at the cost of, you know, of, of you know, pulling others back down, right? So it is great that women have made great progress in um, education going rates. And right now, though, uh, girls outperform boys at every educational level, K through 12 on grades, on test scores, right, like considerably. They're now outperforming men in terms of college going rates and graduation rates. Um, the biggest slide in enrollments in higher ed during the pandemic were, were men. There were seven times more men who dropped out of higher education than women during that slide. Um, crazy other statistics, right, that, you know, you pointed to 
the number of men who have just completely dropped out of the labor force, um, you know, our unemployment rate doesn't count anybody who says, no, nope, I'm no longer looking for work. Right. We just drop them out of the denominator, which is one of the silliest things that I can possibly imagine. These are folks who have just literally given up on looking for work, mm -hmm. you know, of, of working age, you know, uh, men who not just unemployed, they're completely out of the labor force, right? And, you know, there was a book called uh, Deaths of Despair that was written by Angus Deaton and his wife, Ann Case. Angus is a Nobel laureate um, and was largely recognized for this work where they started to identify that in the United States, the average lifespan was actually going down. It's the first time this has ever happened in a developed country. And it's mm -hmm. mainly being driven by men, primarily, and what they call deaths of despair, right? So these are things like drug overdose, alcohol abuse, and alcohol-related deaths, uh, suicide, right? And so I think, you know, we we are literally facing a, a what I'll call a crisis with boys and men, but we still have all kinds of other inequities that we're trying to address, right? And I think part of the problem right now, the challenge is that as we have lifted up the visibility of inequities with you know, women in the pay gap in the workplace and, you know, several other, you know, underrepresented minorities in so many different fields and in, and in higher education, it's kind of hard for people to be like, oh, and yeah, we should care about boys and men, right? Like that just doesn't seem like where our, our heads and attention go, but, but it is a real issue and a real challenge and something that I think we need to pay more attention to. And again, you know, Reeves, I think makes a, a really excellent point that by lifting up boys and men in this case, right? It doesn't mean that uh, it's a detriment to, you know, not also continuing the work of lifting up girls and women. Mm -hmm. We can do both, we should do both, uh, but the men part of the equation just isn't on anybody's radar right now. Yeah, I'm curious why that is, because I agree not a lot of people talk about it. Um, I, I, I've come across this statistics through some just some re other research I was doing. And what's um, and, and I think there you're right, we just kind of forgot about the men. And I, and I think that that creates um, further kind of societal challenges, because as women become more independent, make more money, there's also a lot of statistics around how women stay single longer, less people are having children, less people are getting married, which I think is, a, is, a, is an issue on its own. But uh, not something I'm, I'm quite versed in, but something I feel very strongly about. So hopefully, maybe that's <laughs> save it for another conversation. Um, and 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 then there's this whole aspect of the remote work, right? Because then uh, part of it is uh, not just men, but but you know, gener young generations, particularly Gen Zs, you know, they are already kind of feeling disconnected and disengaged in general. And on top of that, loneliness is the highest that's ever been. Suicide rates are higher than there have been for a lot of these rates that have gone up. They're actually for um, uh, teenagers, even before the work, like they're into the workforce, like 14 and up. And, and all of that is because we're, we are so technologically advanced, but we're disconnected. One of the things that I, you know, that is unpopular opinion is I say young people, and this is something I've implemented in the company I'm work, I work with here for our young talent. You must be in the office for one year with us. After that, you have, you're eligible to be remote, but you must be two times a week. You have to come into the office. I will be there with you. And that's what we've done. And we have seen a significant change between young cohort, young talent cohorts that came in the year before them in terms of their uh, performance, engagement, social skills, professionalism, all of that, because they were in the office. And of course, there was supplement training that we've done. So I'm a huge proponent of bring young people into the office, not five days a week, but two, three days a week. So it, it, the, the especially like, you know, fresh graduates, like first two, three years, I don't think yeah. they understand how important it is to this. So when you're working with companies and maybe corporates in particular, have you seen that more companies are like, you know, not those that are putting people in the office because of a commercial real estate issue, which is fine. But I'm talking <laughs> those that are actually, you know, that 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 I, I, I tend to agree with that. Yes, save the commercial real estate, but the young talent po programs, are people intentionally making that happen what have you seen yeah look i think it's still all over the place you know there uh there has first of all been a full embrace of hybridity right I, you know that that is here to stay the question is you know how uh, like how hybrid right like how remote and and how much in person and what's the right balance of that and and then when we are spending time in person are we maximizing the quality of that time or is it just show up be there I'll call it, you know, busy, you know, regular work time, or are we being really, really intentional with what we're doing when we are in person, right? So I think that there is just still a ton of learning and experimentation that is going to happen. Um, but certainly, you know, to your point, right, you think about examples of where it makes sense. 
you know, I've seen large employers who are running apprenticeship programs and the graduation rates of those programs are boosted dramatically through cohorting. And the cohorting does in include a lot of intensive in-person time, right? And you think about a fresh graduate right out of college, they may prefer very much the flexibility of being remote, um, but that in-person time, especially when they're at, you know, a highly impressionable phase of their work life, like they've never had a full-time job before, um, you know, they've never been exposed to colleagues in person. You know, I was reflecting on my, I'm in my mid forties. I've been in, you know, a job for a long time. I, I knew a lot of my colleagues before the pandemic. And so now zoom time kind of works okay. Right. Mm -hmm. But, but, you know, if that had been me, my very first year out of college, my gosh, it would have been a very different, uh, experience. And so I do think that we will find more examples of the value of in-person time. But it's not just going to be because we've got a lease and we need people to come back to the office because we've got this space and it's empty and you need to be here. It's going to be much more intentional in terms of how we use that time together. Um, but there is certainly going to continue to be a long uh, and I'll call it permanent embrace of hybridity to some degree. It has unlocked new talent pools in ways we didn't have before. Right. Mm -hmm. So you think about students who can't afford to do an internship in cities like Washington, D.C. or New York City or San Francisco and the ability to do a virtual internship right on their way to potentially getting a job. Um, you know, those are things that now open up the talent pool more broadly. That's an example of a net positive. Uh, but I think we just you know, the simple point is we have to be much more intentional about how we use in person time, because what will happen is if we're not, people are going to go, yeah, well, I went to the office. No one was there. We didn't really mm -hmm. do anything interesting. I sat in my cubicle and, you know, barely interact with anybody. That's not going to bring people back to the office, right? Nor are the right. gimmicky things like, hey, free beer. And, you know, like <laughs> like those, those days yeah. that the gimmicky tools are over, it has to be thoughtful and intentional. And, and even I would say baking in real social time to that uh, where it's not, you know, specific work, but, you know, opportunities to to have people, you know, think about like, you know, professional icebreakers, right? What gave you energy? What took your energy personally and professionally? Please mm -hmm. discuss that, right? And and so those types of tools that uh, that have been used largely in, you know, management coaching or, you know, other types of forms, I think we're going to see more of that type of thing happening in this intentional in-person time together. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a, it's it's definitely a, a hard one to 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 maneuver, and um, I'm curious how it's all gonna come out, especially now, yeah. like more and more people. So it's uh, uh it's quite interesting, but um, I, I'm old school, so I like my well, you know, although we 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 are primarily remote, but we do have an option to kind of go in once or twice a week, and I always take advantage of that. And uh, but now our young cohort is graduated, so now they're they're the the last cohort they've graduated, so now they're they're like, okay, we're gonna be remote, but I still have a couple of them that like come in. And, and see us and stuff so it's um I, anyway i think i think i think it's a tough one to figure out as you said so as we kind of wrap up this discussion what i really want to kind of um uh, uh spend this next few couple of minutes talking about is something that i focus and something that i've seen a lot in the work that i do whether with youth or corporates is that really just taking ownership and 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 being at your best performance wherever you are and a big proponent for that for me is physical fitness and activity and how well we sleep, the basics that we overlook, what we eat, how much water we're drinking, do we go check out, do our physical? And you yourself, you are a two, a former two-sport division one athlete, uh, if I'm not mistaken. So your sports, I'm sure, have influenced your career and the way you approach leadership. So what? How, how do you see that? Do you see this, I guess, a connection between the level of performance in a workplace and how far somebody goes in their careers? As uh, And is there to you a kind of connection between sports and well-being overall, not just, you know, yoga and maths, but I mean, actual physical well-being? Yeah, look, I, I think workplaces, you know, largely have have been embracing, you know, or continue to embrace well-being broadly defined right and in and in well-being you know that's a that's a multi-dimensional definition right um financially uh secure is a component of well-being right uh you know having a um you know a, a, a robust social life and that doesn't mean you have tons of friends uh, it might mean you only have a couple friends but you spend a lot of quality time with them right or with family right and 
Um, and it certainly does have a physical health component, which is about regular exercise and movement. And it is about eating, you know, healthy and nutritious food and getting good sleep. These are things that, you know, ironically, I, I sort of joke about this, but like traditional college experience is like the opposite of all that, right? <laughs> right. You, you don't sleep very well. You don't eat very well. Like, you know, you, a lot of students lose track of their kind of fitness regimen and goals. You know, you're drinking a lot of alcohol. I mean, again, I'm, I'm overly generalizing, right. but you know, there's a lot of aspects of college where you go, is it promoting well-being or actually training something a very different opposite <laughs> end of it, right? So, you know, that was where my outside the classroom days started as I looked around at an epidemic of binge drinking on college campuses. And I was like, really, this is what it's all about? And, you know, uh, students, you know, literally uh, pissing away their college opportunity because they've gotten so involved in, you know, the drinking social game. So, so look, I, I think enlightened organizations, are really thinking very thoughtfully about how do we promote well-being, and that is everything from uh, you know allowing employees to take walking meetings, right? Thinking about being able to stand up at standing desk, uh, creating opportunities to move throughout the day, um, thinking about how they can support those healthy behaviors, you know, in the workday and outside of that through various um, benefits that are part of the benefits package, and you know, you go back to sports. I mean. You know, those of us who, uh, you know, were involved in competitive athletics, like, you know, there were there were a lot of things that you learned there. Right. I mean, it was time management because I ran track and cross country. We were getting up in the mornings and doing two a days, you know, in between <laughs> classes and you had to eat right. You had to go to bed really early or you were just totally exhausted. Like you had to maximize your study time because you had this narrow window between eating and sleeping that like, if you didn't do that, you were toast. Right. And, um, and so I think, you know, that discipline, uh, you know, that, that, that pain and struggle that was part of it uh, are really important, valuable lessons. I don't know that you need to be a division one athlete to learn those lessons from sport, mm -hmm. um, but, but teamwork, right. And thinking about all that comes from, you know, sports, even if you're not competitive, I think the teamwork understanding of, uh, you know, the sports experience is really valuable. So certainly something that, you know, I'm a big proponent of. Um, and, you know, I think that we we still have a lot uh, like hybridity. There's still going to be a lot of experimenting around how does an employer maximize well-being for its employees? It becomes a cultural attribute. Right. And it's embedded in all aspects of of how the organization operates. Um, and, and there are organizations that are already there um, doing that. I think we're gonna see a lot more of it. I think it matters a lot. This is also where the um, the four day work week discussion has really come into play. And you know, it's, it's, it's created and it's gotten some traction in a number of places. I kind of think where we're headed is, is a four plus one work week where you know, we'll, we'll do four days equivalent of actual work on task, right? And, and a day that would be fully dedicated to ongoing learning, upskilling, reskilling, mm -hmm. right? Other aspects of supporting employee well-being. Um, so, you know, that's that's ultimately where I think this is headed. But mm -hmm. but time, you know, on you know, at work is going to start to change as a definition, right? If we thought about a 40-hour work week as, you know, time on task of my job, I don't know that that's going to be the case. It might be 30 hours on task. It might be 35 hours on task. But there will be more time in the traditional work week, so to speak, dedicated to things like learning, growth, development, well-being. That's definitely where the future is headed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, I I tend to agree. You know, I have a short, funny story. I was speaking at an HR conference like over the summertime, and it was um and uh, it was around like talent and stuff, and the well-being topic came up, and the there was a a leader in an organization um and they they said listen like our employees you know we want to encourage them to 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 use the uh less time they get a lot of sick time and uh, da, 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 and all that stuff and then and you know of course there's a traditional kind of well-being perks and stuff like that and then i asked them the, the leader who's actually leading on all these things and I said well how are you practicing 
what is it that you're trying to get them to do? And it was just, and she, it was crickets, you know, and then she started laughing, you know, it was, I wasn't trying to call her out, but she started laughing and everybody, you know, we all collectively laughed like in a, in a, in a, in a, in a kind way, because it's like, well, yeah, that's is where it starts. It starts with you as a leader. Sure. There needs to be policies and systems in place, but what, you know, whatever you're doing, whatever team you have, you have to practice those things. That is the best way to encourage people, right? Um, you're not going to go and, and go to their house and tell them drink more water or sleep earlier. But if they see you at your peak performers performance that might influence them so anyway I, th- I just always find those funny because there's so many billions of dollars spent on well-being um and yet it's not where it's getting worse in many cases okay. so um the last question i have for all my guests is uh, well actually before we do that um where do you spend a lot of your time i know you have a beautiful um uh newsletter uh, uh busted gold bold um by the way love the logo love the colors very catchy love the content besides i know you're huge on linkedin is there anywhere else that you spend time if people want to follow you get in touch with you well look my, most of my my energies on that front are you know linkedin and i, I continue to occasionally write for forbes on forbes.com so you know that's uh that's one of the outlets and you know, frequently engaged in conversations like these, uh, but LinkedIn is probably the best uh, best place to follow because that's where you know most of these things flow. And um, you know, it it uh, it's 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 an amazing community. I mean, I give it a plug every time. You can go to conferences. Conferences have certain value. I think of LinkedIn as my twenty four seven conference. I mean, it's just it's always on. There's always uh, thoughtful interactions and dialogue. Um, it's amazing that you know you, you're able to connect with people all over the world. And I really feel like I have. Um, a lot of LinkedIn friends, people who I've never met, but, um, you know, at some point maybe in person will do, uh, but that's, uh, that's definitely the, the best place to stay connected with me. Sounds good. So the last question I ask all my guests is what is one question you wish people would ask themselves more often? Um, two questions, the most important two questions in the world. One is, do I have someone who cares about my development? Ask yourself all that time. If your answer to that is no get yourself to a different place where that answer is yes. And the second one is, do I have a chance to do what I'm best at every day? Not once a week, not once a month, not all day long, but at some point each day, do you touch that moment in the work that you're currently doing where you say, I had a chance to do what I'm best at each day. So do I have someone who cares about my development and am I able to do what I'm best at each day? If you can say yes to those two things, uh, that's about as that's about as uh, big a home run as you can hit in life. Mm, those are beautiful. Brendan, thank you so much for your time. I appreciate the work that you're doing and look forward to continuing to, to, to read your work and follow you and, and continue to engage with you. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Mm-hmm.